You're listening to The Creation Academy, a weekly podcast defending the truth of God's Word in biblical creation science. I'm your host, Steve Schramm, and um, this week I'm excited to talk to you uh, about an issue um, really of both uh, scientific and uh, philosophical even importance. Now, this is really an issue that finds its way into um, popular conversations, especially conversations that end up um, being apologetic in nature. In other words, you're defending the faith against somebody. And really, I, I guess this is mostly due to the um, evolutionary view, right, that most people uh, share. And what I find is that often there's a huge disconnect, um, uh, I, I mean a huge disconnect between um, what scientists uh, know and and say, what philosophers know and even say, and then how lay people understand these things. And this is certainly the case with what we're going to talk about today. Now, this is nothing new. What we're going to talk about today, uh, we're actually going to look at a video from about... Um, uh, six years ago, all right, it was 2012 in September uh, that this video was released. It's only five minutes and 35 minutes long, but we're going to stop it throughout and talk about some things, uh, so no doubt uh, we'll go a little bit longer. Um, but this has to do with the concept of nothing, and it's our good friend, Lawrence Krauss. Um, and if you don't know about Lawrence Krauss, actually, he was just recently uh, found to be in a a a, a scandal uh, as part of the Me Too movement. If you have been keeping up with that, um, I think he has. Um, I think he's had nine charges of sexual abuse allegations uh, brought against him. Uh, we need to be careful, all right, of our response on that. Uh, I think we need to pray, right? We need to pray for him. That would be the Christian thing. Uh, to do. Certainly, we need to pray for the families uh, that were um, affected by this issue. But uh, Krauss is pretty well known um, popularly. Uh, he associates with a lot of the new atheist movement. Um, I'm sure he could be considered a new atheist himself. Um, he uh, is is kind of known for that you know, laid back uh, demeanor where, you know, it, it's kind of cool and trendy to say that religion is dangerous. And if we could just come up with enough quips against your debate opponent, right, um, you can really make some um, rhetorical headway, so to speak, with um, your audience. And so he definitely knows how to work a crowd. He knows the right words to say. But this is also true of the way he handles science. Now, Krauss is one of those um, who I consider kind of like Neil deGrasse um, Tyson uh, in that he is a science a popularizer. He is a, um, I want to say an astrophysicist. Um, uh, I believe, yeah, he, he's an astrophysicist. But uh, at the same time, um, he is, you know, uh, he does not confine his work to the laboratory, uh, so to speak. He goes out and um, really evangelizes, um, in a sense, for scientism. Um, I think he would be more than comfortable accepting um, the label as somebody who says that science can or will eventually explain everything. And so one of his latest attempts uh, within the last few years is to try to explain how the universe could have come about from nothing. Because you see, uh, it, especially if you ask a new atheist or one of their followers, um, the way that they perceive religionists to argue for say, the existence of God, is to do so in kind of a uh, God of the gaps, or as as Dawkins put it, like a God hypothesis kind of thing. In other words, uh, that we use God to explain gaps in our current knowledge. Now, anybody who's been listening uh, to this podcast, who reads um, apologetic materials, you know that is not the way that we argue for the existence of God. Uh, God, uh, for many um, uh, theological and philosophical reasons, um, 
and, and even scientific reasons, because God is not a natural being, uh, there is just no um, no basis for simply asserting that God is the um, is a scientific explanation or should be reduced to a hypothesis for explaining some kind of phenomena found in the natural world. Uh, in fact, thinking this way often results in a bifurcation fallacy or um, a um, uh, 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 a false dilemma. In other words, uh, somebody says, "Well, either the law of physics holds the laws of physics hold the nature together, or uh, God holds the laws of nature together." And so uh, we have the laws of physics. Therefore, we don't need God. But this is fallacious reasoning. Um, I see no reason at all uh, that we could not say that. Since we know that God upholds the universe, we've discovered that we have laws of physics, that the laws of physics are simply the way that God upholds the universe. Now, it is true that we can observe the laws of physics and not have to posit God, but see, then we have unanswered questions. Then we don't have any justification for believing that the laws of physics are going to remain constant. See, we have promises, though, from God in Jeremiah and in Genesis and in Colossians uh, that, that, that God is actually upholding this universe uh, within himself. And so if God were to simply let go of the reins, so to speak, for even a brief moment in time, everything would just simply fall apart. And I think that really speaks to the sustaining power of our Creator. Without Him, it would just completely fall apart. And... um the God hypothesis, if you want to put it that way, I'm not comfortable putting it that way, but if you want to think of it in those terms, it does provide rational justification for what we know to be true about the universe. Um, in this respect, uh, speaking about uniformity of nature and, and um, things like that. So uh, a lot of the argument here is that a universe could be created from out of nothing apart from uh, supernatural uh, intervening or supernatural um, tricks. In the video, I believe you'll hear uh, Krauss call them supernatural uh, shenanigans. All right. So um, what we're going to do is, is take a listen through this thing and see if anything jumps out at us. Now, I, I want to qualify this um, – with a, a saying from a pretty pretty well-known uh, Oxford scientist and um, philosopher, mathematician. His name is Dr. John Lennox, very well-respected in the Christian community. Um, certainly um, does not hold a, a lot of the same views we do, um, most certainly regarding creation. He's actually written a book um, called Seven Days That Divide the World um, about how uh, you know, essentially, the premise is that this is you know the that the the length of the days or the um, the amount of time is a non-issue, and of course, I, I would take issue with that. But nevertheless, um, this is a pretty smart guy. I really like uh, Dr. Lennox, and um, in response to something that the late Dr. Stephen Hawking uh, said in one of his books, The Grand Design, I believe it was. John Lennox said this, Nonsense remains nonsense, even when talked by world-famous scientists. And what an interesting uh, way of putting things. Um, what this really goes to show is that uh, the myth of neutrality is most certainly a real thing. In other words, um, somebody uh, is is who who does not believe in God, uh, most especially somebody who actively asserts that there is no God, and even more than that, tries to find ways about, for, for explaining the universe um, without having to posit a God as if he were some hypothesis, um, uh, simply are going to wind up saying nonsensical things, despite the fact that they're well-known, despite the fact that they're well-educated, um, that does not make uh, this kind of person the torchbearer of truth. And so we have to take everything that we see and hear, even from people who are well-respected, with a, um, a grain of salt, so to speak. So as we go through this, uh, you need to consider that. Now again, uh, 
we're going to jump in between uh, complicated concepts, uh, between scientific content and philosophical content. So this one's going to be a little bit different, um, but I trust you can hang on with me as we look through this issue and try to get to the bottom of this. What does it mean um, to have a universe created from nothing? Uh, exactly. So let's uh, begin this thing and see what we can find out. Let's talk about this whole idea of nothing. Uh, explain your book, if you will, first of all. I mean, you say the universe was created without the hand of God and that science can explain why everything exists. So explain that. <laughs> well, let me make it clear. I say it's plausible that it was created uh, without God. I, I think that's what's worth celebrating is the fact that we, we can see some plausible steps. We don't know all the answers, and I don't claim we know all the answers, but even the fact that the laws of nature themselves could have created everything we see, all 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars from nothing, is absolutely remarkable. And so already here we have something very interesting. Uh, remarkable indeed, I would say. We've got two problems already. We've not made it but 35 seconds into um, the video. You'll notice here that um, this news anchor seems to be very ignorant of uh, of lingo, of terminology. Of course, she may just be um, echoing uh, Dr. Uh, Krause's um, kind of ignorance here on this issue in order to kind of uh, get to draw out his ideas. Um, but she says that, um, uh, you know, she asks, what about this idea that science, quote unquote, can explain everything? And if you've been listening to this podcast for a little while, you ought to know that this is actually a logical fallacy called the fallacy of what? Reification. The fallacy of reification. And what this fallacy does, um, essentially, is ascribes um, personal agency to um, abstract concepts. So, in other words, science um, can't, uh, not only can it not explain anything, or can not, uh, not explain everything, but it can't explain um, anything. Science in itself, has no explanatory power. What is science? Science is a method, right? Science is is this method of collecting data and making uh, predictions, developing hypotheses, um, falsifying your work, testing the predictions, um, iterating, trying to see if... Um, uh, trying to make it work with different versions of it until ultimately you get to the point where there's no better explanation than the one that you have for a certain thing. In a very real way, um, science does not deal with truth. It, it, it's a probability uh, factor. Science deals with what is most probably the case. So... Um, uh, we need to realize this, and it's important. It sounds just like a wordplay kind of thing, but it's really not. It's actually very, very important because it underscores this whole idea that scientists have a worldview through which they interpret the lens. Now, everybody would love to believe that science is able to speak to issues in a conclusive way. Way now we do have uh, in science what we call laws. For example, um, we uh, know that uh, gravity is based on a law. We can expect gravity to work. We we ascribe this law to to describe what we mean by the um, phenomenon of of gravity, and we understand that. And we don't expect those things to change. Now again, remember this expectation of um, uh, uh, of these things to continue really is only present on a Christian worldview, um, on atheism, which would um, have us to uh, expect a chance universe, a random universe. Indeed, that's really the only possibility I see for having a universe at all on atheism is if it is just complete um, random chance. All that kind of universe, there's no basis for assuming that kind of uniformity. And again, we'll talk about this in a minute, I think. Um, I think I have this on my notes. But again, this is why the, the whole um, enterprise of science in itself was really um, established by theists, both Christian and Islamic theists, who had a certain expectation of uh, the kind of God who created the universe, developed really the scientific method um, because they expected the universe to be a certain way in virtue of what 
um, they, uh, their theology taught them. And so science, um, in a very real sense, um, historically speaking, is dependent upon um, not only philosophy, but also upon theology. And so without a good theology, there's really no backdrop to why we can expect the science to work. You see, at this point, it's, it's kind of like the illustration that Dr. Greg Bonson used to use, right, of the child who is um, sitting on his father's lap and slapping his father's face kind of thing, right? It, 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 it's kind of like, okay, so our theology has allowed us to develop the scientific method, and so now that we have the scientific method to explain natural phenomena and causes, now if we just remove you see, the theological backdrop, now we don't have to posit God. So now we just get the benefits of the kind of universe that we have if God created it, but now we can explain things in terms of natural law and natural phenomenon and no longer need God. And so where it seems like a very small thing to just say the words, science can explain everything, you need to realize that this fallacy of reification has a tremendous impact on this debate. Because again, scientists are, um, to look at it one way, going to interpret the evidence based on if they have um, gotten rid of this theological backdrop in their own view. In other words, if science um, can explain everything that needs explaining about the world, and therefore only the physical world um, is that which exists, then we no longer need God, so to speak. Well, the person who interprets evidence in general is going to interpret uh, the the facts of nature much differently according to that worldview than the person who has maintained this theological backdrop. And of course, there's other issues in there as far as scriptural um, inerrancy and how much of the scripture we want to take seriously and uh, in any sense. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that that are involved in that, but just realize that this issue is actually quite important, and we shouldn't let people get by with this. We need people to understand as we're talking to them where we're coming from, and where we're coming from is that there is no neutral ground. There's no such thing as taking the science and just following the evidence where it leads, because ultimately it's going to lead wherever your worldview and assumptions take it. So we need to point this out. Now, something else that Dr. Krauss um, says as he's answering this question for uh, the interviewer here uh, is, is quite interesting. Uh, in fact, he says it is remarkable that we could potentially have laws of nature creating the universe. Now, indeed this would be remarkable. And I would go on and venture to say that it would be remarkable because it is impossible. Now, why is that? Well, remember, it is by their own admission, and if you've talked to anybody for any length of um, time on these issues, especially using a transcendental approach to apologetics, um, we often press unbelievers on the issue of the uniformity of nature, as we talked about a few minutes ago. How do you justify the uniformity of nature in a random chance universe if it is, in fact, not upheld by God. And so they will posit um, these laws of nature, which we have, uh, th that describe aspects of the physical universe. But now, what does, that, what does that mean? Well, that means, especially on their view, on their view of materialism, these laws of nature are just descriptions that we give them, um, uh, that we give... Uh, the way that the uh, that we observe the universe to work, we describe these things and call them laws. But this means that, in some sense, they are a part of nature. In other words, laws have no causal power. Now, here's what I mean by this: it is impossible that there, there, there if, if if no universe exists. And laws of nature are the things which describe the um, facts of nature or, or, or the way that we see um, matter interacting, so to speak, in nature, then that means that they cannot have pre-existed nature. 
See, we've got a chicken and an egg problem. The laws of nature can't create the universe. And this is because without the universe, there are no laws of nature in existence. So this is a very important uh, point. And, 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 and really, again, this is going to kind of go to our actual uh, uh, overall point here in that when um, Dr. Krauss uh, says that we have a universe from nothing, and remember, this is kind of the title of his book. Um, I think the title was actually A Universe from Nothing. So he argues for this. But when he says nothing, he doesn't actually mean nothing, as in um, the ultimate sense of, of no thing. That, that is not the way that Krauss defines uh, nothing. And it has to do with quantum particles, and, and, and we're, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, but I just want you to see uh, the problems here, that already we've got a ramification by the anchor, which is kind of feeding into Krauss's uh, delusion that somehow science is going to explain everything, um, when in fact science can't explain anything. And then we've got the issue that the laws of nature cannot exist without a universe. And yet somehow these have causally created the universe. But again, this is uh, not remarkable, as, as Dr. Krauss claims. Um, rather, it's actually uh, impossible. And the discoveries that have made that possible, that idea possible, are worth celebrating. The point is that we kind of realized after a uh, hundred years of studying the universe that the total energy of the universe could be precisely zero. And if you were going to create a universe from nothing, that's probably a good first step. The laws of quantum mechanics tell us that empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. Strange things can happen. And in fact, it's possible, without any supernatural shenanigans, for matter and particles to be created from nothing. It's even possible that space and time themselves popped into existence from nothing. It's allowed by the laws of physics. And that is so remarkable that, that we shouldn't feel it's a, a threat. We should celebrate this new discovered knowledge. Uh, so hopefully you're 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 kind of keeping up here, and you're 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 hearing these things and picking them out um, a, a, as you go along. And uh, I, I love some of the phraseology that he uses, and without really realizing the philosophical differences. Now, in a debate between um, um, uh, Dr. Krauss here and Dr. William Lane Craig, um, I heard him criticize Craig, as many scientists often do, uh, criticize uh, philosophers for not understanding science. But I want to say that the shoe uh, is really on the other foot here. Uh, scientists, uh, especially in these last few years, really do not understand philosophical distinctions and philosophical issues. And uh, I, I mean, this is evidenced by the fact that a man could possibly claim that it is allowed by the laws of nature for something to pop in existence from nothing, when again, the laws of nature uh, are what describe the something that we see. So therefore, um, this nothingness cannot possibly be um, uh, what the layperson, especially the average watcher of CNN, um would actually mean when somebody says nothing. This is a very misleading and, uh, in my opinion, a very disingenuous way uh, to spread your views. So we'll talk about a couple things here. Um, he said that um, the universe could actually, the total amount of the energy in the universe um, could actually be zero. And that this kind of thing would um, allow, due to um, quantum fluctuations, uh, that the universe could create itself. Um, and that also uh, the positive and negative energy in the universe cancel each other out, which in fact adds up to zero. That's the zero energy universe um, theory. Now there are a couple uh, problems with this theory, especially um, right off the bat. So number one, how in the world, how in the universe, you might say, could we ever actually know this? In other words, in order to actually know that the total energy of the universe was um, zero, and without using philosophical, um, specifically Big Bang, okay, assumptions, how could we ever dream of knowing the entire energy content of the universe? Now, this seems like um, 
an unreasonable objection to race. In other words, I could see somebody saying, well, how, you know, how could you possibly, um, um, you know, posit a God in light of those same circumstances. Maybe there's something out there in the far reaches of the universe that we, we don't know about yet. And, and so they could use that as sort of an argument from silence. So, um, let's not be ignorant here that what we're claiming here, um, is probably not going to be received very well by them, but, but we need to explain it then in a, a very correct and a very, um, um, a sensible way. Uh, in other words, it is literally impossible that we could know without a shadow of a doubt by direct testable observation the entire energy content of the whole universe. So we just need to simply point out that this um, uh, this contention here, this assertion, really is dependent upon Big Bang assumptions. Now, this is not going to be a problem for most people. Uh, it certainly doesn't appear to be a problem for Dr. Krauss. Um, and again, largely because the Big Bang is the most accepted um, cosmological model of, of the universe. But it's not without its issues. Um, so we need to be cognizant of the fact that we are indeed... Um, in a sense, assuming what we're trying to prove, right? Because uh, uh, at least from from the young Earth argument, our um, our our assertion would be the Big Bang, in fact, um, is not the correct uh, model of the universe. And so, in a sense, they are they've already assumed what they are trying to prove. This is a theory that is largely based on another theory, um, which happens to be really the issue in question. Now. The second problem really dials in a little further on those um, pesky <laughs> Big Bang uh, assumptions. Now, according to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, all right, now virtual particles can fluctuate quickly in and out of existence. Now, get this. This is important. Within the vacuum of space. But this happens in infinitesimally small infinitesimally, excuse me, small, uh, blips of time. And in fact, Dr. Josh Hartnett has pointed out that um, this is something like 10 to the negative 103rd power, which is just insane to even imagine, uh, for a quantum event the size of our universe. All right, so now, in order to get our universe... Guth, Alan Guth, his inflation theories, which uh, his initial theory has been proven wrong, by the way, and every other theory past that, they're not agreed upon, uh, and they are not mathematically successful at all to explain the entire universe. In fact, there is no good inflation theory, which the Big Bang requires to get off the ground. There is no, as of right now, good inflation theory that actually makes sense of all the data. But all of these things must work out and Physicists must be indeed right about the zero energy theory for this to work out. And at present, neither of these seem justified. Now, uh, what you, I'm not sure if we've heard it yet or what you will hear. I think you will hear Dr. Krauss say is he'll make a reference to the, the fact that the universe seems like the ultimate free lunch. And this is something that Alan Guth himself offered. He's the one who pointed out, but look, there's no such thing as a free lunch. In other words, um, what this is saying is that it's awfully convenient that this just so happens to be the way that the universe is. And, and here's another way of putting it. Um, one problem that I often have, and we talked about this a little bit in the past few weeks, but one problem that I have is when, um, when, uh, old age universe people and, and specifically, um, well, you know, whether we're talking about Christians or non-Christians, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, let's just say non-Christians in this context, um, you know, they're going to say, well, you know, you, you, you need to violate certain laws of nature throughout time. And by the way, I don't necessarily think that's true. I do think there was a time, uh, I think, I think during cre creation week and also possibly a little bit during, uh, the flood that the laws of physics, there were some things that were a little bit different during that time. Um, and so people get on our case about that. But what about the fact of a universe coming in and out of existence? I mean, uh, coming into existence on its own accord. Scientifically speaking, this requires the violation of, we talked last week, I think, about at least uh, three laws of nature. The first and second laws of thermodynamics. And then, of course, to get life, you have to violate the law of biogenesis. So you've got those issues. Um 
And uh, uh, essentially, by saying, by, by Guth himself offering that the universe is the ultimate free lunch, essentially what he is saying here is that if you'll just give us one exception, I can explain the rest of the data, right? And so in a very real sense, this is the God of the gaps argument on the part of the atheist. This is the science of the gaps argument for all intents and purposes. Because what we have here is them saying, look, give us this one exception to the way things worked in the very beginning and we can explain the rest. How is that not just like positing God when you don't have a proper explainer for the rest of your data? That's what they accuse us of doing. And I argue that's not what we do, but that's exactly what they're doing. And they've admitted it just without stating it in a way that would seem obvious to people. This is what they mean. When they say the ultimate free lunch, they mean that they have an exception in the beginning of the universe um, that they don't expect to have at any time in the future and that this uh, is just awfully um, convenient. All right, so, and you'll hear Krauss kind of admit this a little bit too when he claims near the end that um, he does believe that science uh, supports the idea of some sort of, um, or, or doesn't conflict rather necessarily with the idea of some sort of deistic God who just simply starts the universe in the beginning. Well, ultimately, that's because that's the kind of God, right, that Krauss has um, uh, in, in, in his science as the backdrop for his science. That's the way that, that, um, Really, that it works, at least in his mind. Now, um, again, we talked a little bit about these inflation theories, which are needed um, in order for the Big Bang models to work, um, and, and all these other things, in order to be right about the zero energy universe theory. But again, we have to remember the philosophical dis- uh, differences here. They're talking about this quantum vacuum. But we need to remember the fact that these virtual particles, right, exist within the vacuum of space, the quantum vacuum. Here is something that um, you must understand. The quantum vacuum is not nothing. It is uh, space where virtual particles can indeed fluctuate quickly in and out of existence. That is um, not an issue. To my knowledge, that's not really contested. But... That's not nothing. That's not nothing. That's something. That's not nothing in the sense that it is no thing. When we say nothing, we mean no space. We mean absolutely nothing. Ex nihilo. God created ex nihilo. Out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3, I believe, speaks about this. The worlds were framed by things um, which do not appear. So, um, furthermore here, uh, remember that this nothingness is not really nothing. It's just simply the vacuum of uh, space, but nothing to ordinary people. They take it to mean no thing. In other words, not anything. Again, including space. So the whole argument breaks down on this point, but somebody who isn't aware of the philosophical problems here uh, might never know it and might not um, see it. It certainly would not be obvious to them. So um, you're likely you are going to come across people as you're witnessing who have heard popular arguments like this but have never actually been showed the um, immense difficulties with them. Um, and in fact, they've never been showed that they're just simply faulty and um, disingenuous. And so they say that religious people are lying to children. Krauss especially is passionate about this, apparently, that we should not lie to children. Um, and yet this seems to be a blatant, um, maybe not a lie, but certainly a dishonesty, leaving out very important information, um, either that or it's just a serious misunderstanding of philosophy that nothing um, actually means no thing. So that's an important consideration as we continue further. Um, okay, so for those folks at home who just listened to that and they're shaking their heads saying, what, how is this guy saying that something could come from nothing? Um, are you saying that, there, that there's energy in that nothing, in that space? You don't, well, in fact, it, what's, what's really remarkable is once you put gravity into the mix, you can, make, you can have positive energy and negative energy, and you can start out with zero energy and then create positive energy particles that have positive energy, but they're gravitational. Think about it. There was 
Oh. Okay, well, it appears that um, they wanted to play an ad right in the middle of our five-minute YouTube video. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll cut this out, and we'll see you back here in just a minute. Attraction has negative energy, and the sum total can be zero. It sounds like the ultimate free lunch, and it potentially is. Now... All right, so um, there you just heard the comment <laughs> about the ultimate free lunch, um, and it potentially is. So we just heard them talking about gravity. Now, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make a very quick point right here. Uh, it should not be lost on anyone that when he says gravity, what he's actually referring to here goes deeper than that. He's referring to quantum gravity theory. And uh, to my knowledge, no working theory exists for this yet. So if you want to point this out to me, you're welcome to. But I have not found any working theory at all for quantum gravity theory. Um, I, it's just a postulation at this point. Um, and honestly, this whole argument uh, requires uh, that to, to, to work. Now, these things are strange, but the world of quantum mechanics is extremely strange. But we rely on it for the semiconductors that allow me to talk to you right now. And the fact is that nature... The real universe is stranger than we could have imagined. It's, so, it's in fact, far more interesting than, the, than the, the fables produced by Iron Age peasants who wrote them down before the, they even knew the Earth orbited the sun, for example. So what do you say, though, when, when people say, you know, it, it, maybe the, the, the notion of nothing uh, creating something, that, that sounds every bit as unbelievable as saying that God created all this. What do you say to those people? It, well, I, what I say is that the, the real difference is that we're not presuming the answers before we ask the questions. When you say God did it, it's really kind of a, a lazy result saying, well, I don't know how, where it came from, and I'm going to assume intentionality, which is really what our ancient ancestors always assumed. They assumed that everything that happened had some intention. But okay, so, um, by the way, it's undisputed, right, that we are built uh, to see design and intention. Um, there is... It, it, some secular arguments kind of going around there that that say that um and this can be seen actually in um in Dawkins book the blind watchmaker right we are kind of built to see this intention in 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 nature and what they want to argue what they want to say is that we are um built to see this for some sort of survival value it's a post hoc explanation um they blame evolution for this, in other words, and then um, they say that evolution ha is what allows us to see this design and intention in nature, uh, but in fact, it's really just all an illusion. It's just a trick. We're just built to see this for survival value. So in a very real sense, um, evolution is indeed, according to Dawkins, the blind watchmaker because it is not guided, and yet it appears to be designed. But Again, this is just a faulty issue. It's a post hoc explanation at best, meaning that it is an explanation that is offered um, in spite of what they claim to be scientific knowledge now that we did not have before. Uh, it certainly was not an expectation of evolutionary theory at all. It's just simply something, oh, well, evolution must be true, so therefore this is the way things are. But there's absolutely no reason to just say that simply there is design and intention in nature. Perhaps this comes natural to us to see because that's the way the world actually is. And I'm inclined to think that. I'm inclined to think that, um, it, you know, if it walks like a duck, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's um, probably a duck. Um, now, Krauss, as you saw here, remember he said that just saying God did it, right? Now, what he's saying here is that we assume that Christians revert to the God of the gaps argument to explain the universe. That completely mischaracterizes um, our position, though. That's that's not what we hold uh, to be true. We say that we can look at the design and intentionality in nature and rationally infer that information such as this does not come from... Um, Non-intelligent sources. It comes from minds. Uh, consider the contradiction with the SETI program, the search for um, extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, when they expect to hear back certain signals and certain patterns that would be indicative of um, intelligent life out in the far reaches of the universe. But far more complex than that is the very DNA code that builds the cells that you and I are made of.
And so we don't assume design in those things or or we explain them away post hoc, right, um, by saying that evolution just simply tricks us into seeing things this way for our own uh, survival for some reason. Uh, but when it comes to the search for extraterrestrial life, we can have much lower standards, Um for what would actually constitute that life. So um, just take that contradiction into consideration and don't forget the fact that it is them who are positing the ultimate free lunch here. It is them asking for the exception. It is them asking for the God of the gaps. In this case, the science of the gaps. Um, any, Any casual listener might miss this, but you shouldn't miss this. But what we've discovered is is that we've been driven to these amazing discoveries. For example, here's an observational discovery that defies common sense. We have discovered, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, is we've discovered that empty space itself, empty space getting rid of all the particles and all the radiation, empty space weighs something. In fact, it has the dominant energy in the universe. It's causing the universe to expand ever faster, faster and faster. The discovery was so amazing that it was awarded the Nobel Prize last year. Now, that sounds crazy. But it's true. Hmm. And I think the point is that we have to force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality instead of deciding this is the universe we want and we're going for- to force reality to conform to that. The universe doesn't care what we want. And one of the beauties of science is it's forced us to change our attitudes about many things. It's forced us to open our minds. And I, I think that's one of the great aspects of science is that we've learned that our preconceptions aren't always right. And certainly... So- as I say, that you know that we didn't know the truth before asking the universe what the truth is. So then, yeah. So um, I, 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 again, all throughout that we had this reification fallacy um, on the word universe, uh, as if the universe itself is is some sort of intelligent agent that um, uh, that that is capable of producing. Um, results contrary to human experience and that the universe itself in some ways is doing this guiding even though it's not don't miss the reification fallacy but also the pretended neutrality fallacy uh, neutrality fallacy um that is going on in there he fallaciously assumes there at the end of that that we're going to be able to observe uh, the evidence of the universe that follows follow it where it leads um somehow without interpreting or filtering that through our um, preconceived notions about the world, but that that very philosophy itself is a philosophy that is not able to um, be arrived at by simply following the evidence where it leads. You see, that's simply a f- philosophical viewpoint, um, really aimed at ridding the supernatural and saying we can see the physical, therefore the physical is all there. Is and it just goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning about um, uh, uh, science being able to uh, speak for itself versus scientists interpreting the evidence. It's the same thing going on here. Don't miss that. Um, it's just simply a faulty uh, philosophy to essentially say that you don't have a philosophy and that science um, can lead you and take you by observation of the facts alone. Um, Uh, where uh, we need to go. Look, we all have the same facts. Every one of us. We've all got the same facts, but we're going to interpret that differently based on the glasses that we wear, based on the worldview, the filter, um, how we see the world uh, around us. We are going to interpret in that way. Now, when it comes to this, uh, if you want to say that Christians say God did it, well, ultimately we do say God did it. We say that God is the explanation for that which we know and that which we, um, of course, still don't know. Um, but again, back to this ultimate free lunch, um, these uh, just unexpected things that uh, can just coincidentally uh, happen that do sound like the kind of thing that God um, would have causally done and causally ordained at the beginning. But as long as we can um, redefine words and even mystifying words and, 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 and make it say something that it's not— um, Um, And we get our one exception in the very beginning. Ah, then science can explain everything. Isn't that interesting? Is science compatible with religion in any way? Well, look, we can't, I can't argue that there's no purpose to the universe. I can say there's no evidence of purpose to the universe, but there could be purpose that I don't know about. But the point is that what, what we can say is that if there is purpose, it is strongly hidden, and we don't need any supernatural miracles to create everything we see. I think 
in terms of a vague deism, science and religion are compatible in that sense. But in terms of, the, in fact, the actual doctrines of the world's religions, science is not compatible with them. The, the miracles of the Bible are inconsistent with science. But, I, you know, I think most people who claim they're religious don't really think Jonah lived inside of a whale or don't believe, actually, that when a priest blesses a wafer, it really turns into the body of Jesus Christ. I think they kind of throw out the things that they, don't, they think are silly, and they keep the mm-hmm. things they like because they want to believe them. And I so, think that's the main thing. People want to believe that someone's taking care of them, that the universe is a place where somehow they have some meaning. And in fact, what I would argue is if we realize that we create the meaning in our own lives, our lives can become, in fact, richer than, uh, than, than believing in, in these fairy tales. So just to be... Yeah, so a few problems here. Um, this completely misses the fact, like we talked about earlier, that theists invented the scientific method. In other words, those who believe in these, um, quote, fairy tales used the underlying assumptions of the fairy tales, so to speak, to invent the scientific method because they realized what kind of universe we had to be living in. You see, there there was no robust scientific method um, before uh, guys like um, Al Haytham and um, Bacon and, and, and Newton and, and these guys, uh, because in these uh, in an atheistic worldview, there's no reason at all to assume that there's order um, and um, uniformity in uh, the universe. Certainly, on polytheistic views and pantheistic views, there are uh, no reason to assume that. I mean, which god would you uh, would you listen to um, anyway? And on a pantheistic view, where essentially God is the universe, and areas where the universe are different, including the um, uh, either physical or immaterial minds that um, you and I have, uh, they work differently and they contradict one another. So how does that work? How do you have uniformity and um, logical uh, reasoning in that kind of universe? Well, you simply don't. You see, theists realize that we have not only a rational and orderly universe, but also an intelligible universe, a universe in which we are literally made to understand the world around us. And so therefore, we're able to develop the scientific method. You see, this was uh, developed as a method uh, really to glorify God, to learn more about God's creation. And again, we've just simply ripped the carpet out from underneath them and said, look, we don't need uh, God anymore. Um... Uh, but again, this completely misses the point. Now, he also talks about miracles, right? But here's the thing about miracles. By definition, miracles are incompatible with science. He speaks of this as some sort of derogatory thing, but if it could be scientifically tested, that would probably mean that it's a regular occurrence, and if it's a regular occurrence, then therefore, it's not a miracle. So, um, uh, again, he's kind of missing... Um, the point there. And uh, John Lennox and others, uh, in fact, have argued that we need to think about miracles um, not so much as any kind of a violation of the laws of nature, but rather something um, supernatural, something um, outside of nature acting uh, within nature. And so therefore, um, it's it's not a violation of the laws um, of, of physics or, or uh, any of the laws. Um that's just not how we should uh, see a miracle. Now, he also misconstrues what it means to have meaning. Um, and as a astrophysicist, cosmologist, um, he should know that, uh, and he does know, uh, that if the universe um, is indeed as atheists um, uh, say it is, in other words, uh, there is no uh, rescue plan, there is no out, so to speak, um, if we are just uh, rolling along the deterministic course of cause and events, then the universe, according to the second law of thermodynamics, will eventually end in heat uh, death. Um, absent God's intervention, um, ultimate meaning is actually nonsensical. Uh, uh, William Lane Craig um, uh, has written this. He says, Mankind is, uh, on this view, uh, thus no more significant than a swarm of mosquitoes or a barnyard of pigs, for um, their end is all the same. The same blind cosmic process that coughed them up in the first place will eventually swallow them all again. The contributions of the scientists to the advance of human knowledge, the researches of the doctor to alleviate pain and suffering, the efforts of the diplomat to secure peace in the world, 
the sacrifices of good people everywhere to better the lot of the human race. All these come to nothing. This is the horror of modern man. Because he ends in nothing, he is nothing. Unquote. You know, we could really uh, tie this back around. Much like um, our uh, meaning would amount to zero in this universe, um, that actually comports quite nicely with the zero energy universe uh, theory. No energy in the universe, it's all, uh, or, or rather, it's all mathematically zero. Well, the same can be said for meaning. We can create meaning for ourselves, sure, but it's a complete illusion. And it has no ultimate meaning. There's a difference, a, 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 a sincere difference um, between ultimate meaning and uh, meaning uh, that would be frivolous that one could create for oneself. Um, again, these are two wildly uh, different things. And quite frankly, it's a. Um, it's a it's quite a terrible universe um, if we're living in a universe absent God. Be clear though, are you saying there is no God, or that you just believe that the universe was created without the hand of God? Well, I'm not saying I'm not making grand claims that in, in either case. I'm not saying there is no God. I'm saying there's no evidence for God. You don't seem to need a God to create a universe. And in fact, in that sense, I, I personally wouldn't call myself an atheist because I don't presume to claim there's no God. If anything, I declare myself as an anti-theist because I can't say with absolute certainty there is no God. But what I would say is I'd much prefer to live in a universe without one. And there, folks, you have it. You see, there is no evidence for God. Uh, if you're a person, right, who um, does not want the evidence for God, the Bible says that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. He that cometh to God must, in fact, believe that he is. So um, you, you see here the inherent issues. He doesn't want there to be a God. What a startling admission. And this completely goes to discredit his whole enterprise, really, because his whole claim is that we can be neutral observers, right? We can just uh, follow that, the science, follow the evidence where it leads. But according to the Bible, that's impossible. Jesus himself said, um, he who's not with me is against me. So what we have here is that when a person does not want to believe there is a God, he uh, most certainly is able to remain willfully ignorant of the evidence that's discussed in Second Peter. Now, Romans 1 speaks to this issue. Of course, I'm sure many of you knew that I was going to be going there. Um, uh, but listen to this. For the invisible things, this starts at verse 20. We're going to read uh, through verse 23. Uh, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, the invisible things, the attributes of God, are, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, because that, when they knew God, they know God exists, right? Because they asked for their exception at the beginning of the universe. They know God exists, but they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. In other words, um, they've said, uh, look, uh, we need our exception at the beginning, but let's not say that it's God. What happened? Well, they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You see, they glorified him not as God, and because of this, their foolish heart was darkened because they became vain, empty in their imaginations. In other words, their imaginations about things, about the beginning of the universe, ultimately amount to the same nothingness that they claim the total energy of the universe is. Anyway. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. You see, God most simply gave them over, later goes on to say, to a reprobate mind. In other words, you reject God, you willfully reject God, your foolish heart is going to be darkened, and ultimately God is just going to give you up, give you over. He's not going to speak to you anymore. He's not going to even lead you um, to conviction anymore. Um, at a certain point, uh, the Bible says God's Spirit does not always strive 
with man. And I have heard tell of those who um, have even wanted uh, and, and desired. My preacher often tells a story. I don't remember the details, so I'm just going to give it to you vaguely. But and he tells the story of a man uh, who, who may have even been related to him who um, and nearing the end of his life said, I wish I could get saved. I wish I could come to know God, but God just is not speaking to me anymore. This is real. You may even find yourself at a point in time in your life when you want to come to God, but your time has passed. If the Spirit is not speaking to you, you cannot be saved. You must have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. So, again, we see that um, the pretended neutrality uh, neutrality fallacy is is just all over this. We see that... Indeed, uh, Dr. Krauss is not a neutral observer to the universe. He does not want there to be a God, and so therefore finds explanations and tries to find ways around needing to say, um, quote, God did it. What's the ultimate motivation behind this? John 3.19 bears this out. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. What does that amount to? It just amounts to this. Men love their sin. That's not a popular message, but it's a true message. It's the Bible's message. Men love their sin. They love darkness rather than light. They simply don't want there to be a God because if God exists, he created everything. And guess what? He makes the rules. He's given us creation. He's given us a conscience. Romans uh, Romans two fifteen, uh, well, mm, might be fourteen or fifteen. I think it is. Uh, talks about that. Yeah, sure, we all have uh, moral understanding, but it's not because evolution gave that to us. It's because of our conscience, um, which God has given us. And so those are the issues at hand here. I hope you can see that this is a, a completely baseless issue. Uh, you know, what we found really is that this is a man who does not want there to be a God, and so he interprets evidence in light of that. However, in order to get around that, he uses fallacies of reification all the time uh, to give agency to things like u- the universe and, and, and to science to be able to explain things away. He redefines words, um, as in the case of nothing, uh, to actually mean something and not to mean the classical and certainly popular definition of nothing, uh, which would be not anything. Um, And his argument at the end of the day is based completely on assumptions from the Big Bang um, that are not universally accepted by a long shot and um, have certainly not proven to be conclusively true. At the end of the day, um, we don't have a universe from nothing. Indeed, we have a universe that was created by God. In the beginning, the Bible says, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's never been more true uh, than now, uh, as certainly as we can see um, how people try and try and try to escape it and argue against it. Uh, God makes even their speech on network television to come across as foolish. It's logically invalid, um, and uh, it just simply doesn't uh, follow, it doesn't compute. Um And uh, in professing themselves to be wise, indeed, they became fools. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we want to say thank you for the truth. I often say that, uh, Father, I'm thankful that I have the truth, and I also have the proof of the truth. And I'm so glad you've given that to us in our hearts. And uh, through your word that you've revealed to us, Lord, thank you for not leaving us in the dark. Thank you for uh, allowing us to see your majesty and your glory in the creation, your uh, transcendence and even your attributes in the creation. Father, most of all, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us. That should we accept and believe on him, uh, that we could have eternal life. What a blessing. Uh, What a glorious uh, truth And uh, what a glorious expression of the truth you gave us in your son over 2,000 years ago. And we're thankful for him uh, today, uh, Father, and we're thankful for you uh, for creating us, for um, allowing us to to live in your world and uh, allowing us to be able to uh, discover more about you and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to say thank you for joining us again this week. Again, it's been a good time, and uh, we'll get together uh, next week, same time, uh, same place, right here on the Creation Academy. Don't forget to visit the website, uh, stevesram.com, and check out all of our resources there. Thanks, and bye-bye.